if you watch fitness YouTube, you probably know about infamous Jeff Nipper tier list series of videos. It was heavily criticized and left many confused and bamboozled. That's an eight. That's the stupidest shit I've ever seen. But nobody yet systematically reviewed this. And I think this is really important because it's some kind of cornerstone science-based lifting. So in this video I'm gonna show you all the flaws and inaccuracies, logical fallacies, cherry picking, how Jeff butchered the anatomy, etc, etc. So let's start with the back dedicated video. Okay, what about the deadlift? It doesn't stretch your lats or mid-back much at all. The barbell row. It stretches your back quite well and it offers high tension. So tell me, if it's not enough stretch in deadlifts, how is it a good stretch in barbell rows? So doing barbell rows and deadlifts, you keep the same posture at the bottom portion of both lifts. So how can it be different stretch on top of all that? In deadlift, there's gonna be more weight, so it's gonna be even more stretch. It also doesn't take your lats or traps through an active range of motion. There is an active range of motion in deadlifts, because otherwise you'll be pulling like this. But you keep a barbell closer to your body. So this is the range of motion in deadlifts, and it doesn't equal zero. I don't know about you, but deadlifts don't give me a great back pump. So this is a very good representation of anecdotal evidence that science-based lifters don't really like. Is that the straight barbell puts some strain on my wrists. I've been trying these for years and I always feel a little elbow pain. Some people say that they're bad for your knees, but this has been thoroughly debunked. And this is the most confusing. Dips also don't feel the best to me. I find my shoulders get a bit cranky if I do them too much or too heavy. The only downside of dips is that some people find that their shoulders get cranky if they do them too much, although I've never actually experienced that personally. I find my shoulders get a bit cranky if I do them too much, although I've never actually experienced that personally. It seems like Jeff doesn't even remember what he said before. But I don't see anything wrong with using anecdotal evidence, because your training is indeed an anecdotal evidence. I'm not putting it in D or F tier, just because it will beef up your spinal erectors and thicken up that lower part of your back. The funny thing is that many people do not understand that spinal erectors don't end in your lower back. They go from bottom to top, all the way through your spine. So tell me, isn't it back training? And why training spine erectors, which deadlifts do like nothing else does, is bad? Why is it worse than training lats or traps? What you about to see on the following footage might be shocking. But I would say to build overall strength, build thickness and density, this is the best workout that I, that I have personally. Here you can see how Derek Lansford is doing rack pulls. Little does he know that Jeff put this exercise in tier F, and now Derek can say goodbye to bad gains. This makes for not the smoothest feel, but I will say, I don't think dips have the smoothest feel. Please, somebody, elaborate. What is the smoothest feel? Why do all the science-based lifters use this vague terminology? You do really think it's scientific? The Yates row is basically just a barbell row with a more upright posture and with looser technique. So the Yates row is not about looser form, it's about the angle and the Dory himself said that you should do it with a street form. And you can see the difference between Jeff Yates rows and the real Yates rows. An upper posture actually increases the stretch of your lats because you emphasize the pullover movement here. In the following part Jeff will contradict himself again. Shift some back tension to your biceps, so while they are still a great upper body exercise, I'm putting them in B tier for the back specifically. Because so much of your back musculature is also involved, it's unlikely that your biceps will be the limiting factor. So first of all, tell me how chin-ups can shift the tension from your back to your bicep if you can move more weight here. So you just add more weight, it's gonna be the same amount of tension on your back, or even more because it's more weight, right? But on top of all that, Jeff said that it is not a good back exercise because it's like about bicep, bicep will do all the work. Later he said it is not a good bicep exercise because back will fatigue faster. Son of a... Both lat and mid trap activation. This is really funny because Jeff showed us the lower part of the trapezius muscles whilst talking about mid traps. It's funny how this deficit pen lace rows actually don't provide you with more stretch, it just forces you to bend your knees more, and this is what Jeff actually did. So, again, what's the point? Okay, we're moving to biceps now. So, by performing hammer curls, you might shift some tension away from the biceps and toward the brachialis. 
And since the brachialis can push the biceps up more, that should enhance the appearance of bicep peak. Here is Jeffrey confused brachialis with brachioradialis. The fact that she reduced bicep tension won't benefit to brachialis more, it's just brachioradialis will be working more, and this will be a limiting factor, so it has nothing to do with bicep peak and all other gym bro myths. So the preacher curl definitely belongs in S tier. Here is a couple of sense about preacher curls risk reward ratio, because we've seen plenty of videos where something happened during preacher curls, and if you think that you can build bigger bicep doing preacher curls rather than standing barbell curls, which actually does make sense, think about this. Is it worth it? The machine preacher curl has the added benefit of being nice and locked in. Tell me, why being locked is actually considered nice by science-based lifters? Because isn't it that your body is forced to move in a very specific way that this machine only allows you to actually move and you can't even slightly adjust even one inch? So isn't it like more dangerous and really awkward in non natural way to train? This was shown in a recent study that compared incline curls to preacher curls. The preacher curl caused significantly more distal biceps growth, so growth closer to the elbow joint. That's most likely because with the preacher curl, you get very high tension in a pretty good stretch. Okay, it seems like Jeff Nipper and lots of science-based lifters don't really understand physics. And when they talk about tension, they just don't get it. Here is the problem. They say that you can grow bigger part of your bicep here rather than here doing some specific curls, which contradicts the anatomy and physics completely. The reason is why? Here's what's happening when you do bicep curls. Some force tries to pull your elbow here, tries to stretch your bicep and all the muscles this way. So when you engage your bicep and you flex it, it goes the opposite direction. Simple as that, right? and you flex your bicep or other muscles all the way through from point A to point B, from punctum fixum to punctum mobile here. But there are some muscles like trapezius, for instance, we have different parts like upper trapezius, middle trapezius. But if something like bicep, lats, there's no such thing as upper bicep or upper tricep or upper lat. So you can engage harder at here or here just that doesn't happen, right? And the tension of your muscles, of some bands or some strings on guitar is going to be the same from point A to point B, all the way through. Guys, the tension is the same. It's just here and here, for instance, we're talking about strings on a guitar, here is going to be stiffer. But the tension is gonna be the same. The most stable exercise, that tension will be dispersed to other stabilizing muscles. This means your lower body and your core will have to work to keep your balance, which will shift some tension coming from the bar away from your shoulders. Yes, I honestly just do not understand how it works because if you do standing overhead press, you hold a barbell in your hands. It has some mass. Let's just say it's one plate, 60 kilo barbell, okay? It has some weight. It's going to be around 580, 70 newtons, whatever. So this weight goes directly from your hands throughout your body to the ground. So from your hands to your feet. So if you weigh like 80 kilos, you grab this barbell, you stand on scale, it's going to be 140 kilos. Simple. Now this seated variation, the same situation except here your body is not involved anymore so here where the tension ends at your butt level here it ends at your feet level but tell me how this will bring more tension to your shoulders if you hold the same weight and the tension goes all the way through your body here and here. Like it doesn't stop in shoulder area, neither here nor here. What is the point? I just guess I can't even debunk it because I just can't understand the concept behind this. Okay, I got it. When you do some stain variation, you can use more momentum, more cheating. This is, I get it. But a simple fact that you engage your glutes whilst you're overhead pressing and you don't really engage it here when you do seated variation. Like, how is it like 
put any more tension on your shoulders. Like, why? Why? What is the reason behind this? As long as you can control the negative and keep the cheating under control, I'd put them in the bottom of A tier. But at least cheat curls are approved, and we all can feel safe. <laughs> and the medial head runs down the middle, adding shape to the arm as a whole. And again, brilliant knowledge of anatomy from Jeff Nippard, where he tried to show us the medial head of a tricep whilst showing us the tendon. What? For one, it's very anterior delt dominant. When we look at activation patterns across the delt heads, you see that the side and rear heads... So according to science-based lifters, front delts are working much harder than side delts in overhead press. And here's the study that Jeff Nippert used to prove his point. But as also the study when they showed that bicep works twice harder than tricep during overhead press. I mean, I get it, bicep works whilst you're pressing, but twice more than tricep, whilst tricep actually moves the weight and bicep is just a stabilizer. <sighs> Here is why side delts are working as or almost as hard as front delts during OHP. This is the movement that your front delts do. But you don't overhead press like this, do you? And this is the movement that your side delts do. So, as you can see, overhead press is some kind of combination of both of those movements. I personally find I can connect with my side delts even better if I use wrist cuffs. That's because even though my grip won't be a limiting factor here, my forearms still get a big pump and that takes away some of my focus from my delts. Tell me, why forearm pump is actually bad? Does everybody have overdeveloped forearm muscles? I <laughs> don't really think so. And on top of all that, if you grab a dumbbell or cable in your hands, it won't reduce the tension in your shoulders just because your wrists and your fingers won't move any weight. And do you know why these leashed versions actually feel better? Just because they're easier, because there's less leverage. And so the machine chest press is our first exercise getting awarded to S tier. Please, somebody explain the logic. Jeff said that bench press is not as good because some people feel cranky and stuff. Whilst he put machine press, which is exact the same thing, except you've been locked and you have to move a weight with a kind of unnatural trajectory in tier S. Okay, enough of the upper body, let's talk about lower body where Jeff gets even more confusing. I'm actually gonna pick them as my number one option for the middle aspect of the glutes, high A tier. And this is actually my number one exercise for the lower glutes. Okay guys, here's another concept that got me confused completely. When Jeff was talking about lower glutes, what is lower glutes even? There's gluteus maximus, that extends your hips. And for some reason, Jeff put hip thrusts in mid-glute exercise and RDLs in lower glute. Like, guys, do you understand why? I don't. Because what are you doing when you do RDLs? Right, this palace, boom extension, right? What do you do when you do hip thrust? Spot the difference. There is no difference because you do exactly the same pelvis movement. Here and here, gluteus maximus working. What is lower glutes? And why here is lower glutes and here is mid glutes? Why? What is it? It's not even a thing. I just can't take the barbell back squat out of S tier without a guilty conscience. Despite some limitations, I'm still putting the barbell squat in A tier for glute growth. So Jeff puts squats in tier A for glute growth because there are some limiting factors, spine erectors, fatigue, and blah, blah, blah. Whilst he put squats in tier S for quad growth. You can definitely get a good cardio workout with these, and I think they do have some utility for building explosive power, but for glute hypertrophy, you're just not getting enough tension. Low D tier. This part left me butt hurt. Kettlebell swings. 
First of all, what do you mean not enough tension, Jeff? Just grab more weight. Second, why RDLs are good and kettlebell swings are tier D or something, whilst it is absolutely identical movement. It's not like even RDLs versus hip thrusts, because here we have spine erectors are working and hip thrusts, they don't really work. RDLs and kettlebell swings are completely identical. It's just here is more range of motion because you go in between your legs here. RDLs stops here. It's exactly the same. How is it tier D and that's tier A? What is the logic? And don't get me wrong, I respect Jeff as a lifter because he's got jacked and strong while being natural, which I think deserves respect even if you have superior genetics as Jeff Nipper does. But he uses science as some gimmick, as a marketing tool to get more attention, to get more views, to make more money, which of course I can understand the strategy, but I don't think it's fair. But how they say, life is not fair, and at least Jeff can afford his own gym, whilst I can afford only a gym membership. Hit the subscribe button and I'll see you later.